Hello everyone and thank you for joining today's session on Stability Analysis and Design of Steel Structures. Myself Srojit Ghosh and along with me I have Vishwatos Purkasto. Both of us work in bandless systems in engineering simulation group and today we are going to discuss about the stability analysis and how different design code handles the stability analysis and design criteria. Now I'll hand it over to Vishwatos to start the presentation. Hi, welcome. My name is Vishwatosh Prakayastha, mostly known as Vishwa. I'm here in Bentley Systems working as a senior structural engineer for the past 13 years, providing and delivering technical support, webinars, seminars, and other engineering activities related to analysis and design of structure by softwares like STAD, RAM Structural System, STAD Foundation, RAM Connection, and many more to our esteemed user. So today I will try to provide you with some insight on the various stability analysis criteria, its implementation and its proper use in STAD. As the stability analysis and design is a big subject to understand and interpret, we have divided this lecture in two parts. So today's session is on general stability analysis criteria and the next part of the session will be on the stability analysis and design criteria in light of the EISC and Euro design code. So the contents that would be discussed in the first part of the session, that is today's sessions are like linear versus nonlinear analysis theory, understanding the p-delta analysis and on how to perform it in StatPro, performing buckling analysis and geometric nonlinear analysis and its interpretation of the result. Some case studies on stability analysis criteria in StatPro. In the part two, which is the remaining part of the session, which is the upcoming webinar, the subject that would be discussed are design philosophy on stability analysis per AISC code, the difference between ELM and direct analysis method, implementation of direct analysis method in StatPro, Philosophy of Stability Analysis of Steel Structures in Light of Eurocode. So let's get it started. So before moving forward, let's discuss more on the linear and nonlinear function because this is the basis to explain more on the various way to handle the stability situation because uh, the structures behave linearly or non-linearly. So the function f, if we take then, if f of a plus f of b, if it is equal to f of a plus b, then this function is said to be linear. And uh, you can see on the screen in the linear uh, condition, the graph is completely straight. So if you numerically input those values, then if say, for example, f of 1 plus f of 2 is same as f of 3. On the other hand, the nonlinear case, you have you, the e equality doesn't exist. That means f of a plus f of b is not equal to f of a plus b. And if you see the uh, parabolic curve, which is a nonlinear in nature, you can see that uh, f of 1 plus f of 2 is not same as f of 3. So this is nonlinear. So in the linear case, Superposition is allowed and then nonlinear case superposition is not allowed. Superposition is simply the algebraic summation of the individual events. So let's see the various physical phenomena in the physical world where the principle of superposition exists. Now first is the standing wave. You can see here uh, the red and the purple one are the individual waves and uh, you can algebraically sum it up uh, to get the resultant wave which has been represented in the black color similar way the superposition principle can be applied or it does exist in different scenarios in mathematics like differential equation in circuit theory uh, in dynamic analysis you can see here uh, when all the modes individual modes are combined or summed uh, together linearly we'll get the final mode resultant mode and also in the structural analysis uh, uh, when the loads individual loads are acting together 
uh, see here point loads and the uniformly distributed loads are acting together and we sum the individual response of them then we will get the same response when these loads are acting simultaneously so all these conditions are the linear conditions so the superposition exists here now let's see the linearity and the nonlinearity in a structure the left hand side you can see the cantilever beam where the load p1 and p2 are applied independently and if you add the response like displacement delta 1 and delta 2 you'd get the same response when delta 1 and delta 2 are acting simultaneously on the same cantilever on the other hand if this equality doesn't exist as we discussed before then this is a nonlinear case uh, there are various type of nonlinearity in a structure like a geometric nonlinearity, material nonlinearity, and the contact nonlinearity. Uh, geometric nonlinearity is due to the change in the geometric shape of the structure upon the application of the load. Uh, material nonlinearity is due to the nonlinear behavior of the material or the nonlinear relationship between the stress strain pair of the material and the contact nonlinearity which is basically due to the change in the boundary condition of the existing structure so today we will discuss on the geometric nonlinearity which is implemented instead which is uh, the most common phenomenon to determine the stability equilibrium of the structure so there are various ways to handle the geometric nonlinearity of a structure instead uh, they are like uh, p delta analysis direct analysis imperfection analysis large delta analysis which is a separate analysis module called gnl geometric nonlinear analysis which handles the large deflection nonlinear cable analysis tension only compression only member or support analysis so what is stability of a body now stability is explained as stable equilibrium or the unstable equilibrium now the stable equilibrium is a state in which a body tends to return to its original position after being disturbed and is essentially convergent in nature and the unstable equilibrium is a state in which a body doesn't stand to return to its original position after being disturbed and uh, essentially the response is divergent in nature now see two scenarios in the picture here if we give a slight nudge to the existing body in the unstable case the body would move further away and might collapse and own come back to its initial position and in the stable equilibrium it will roll back to its initial position similarly a structure can be in a stable or unstable equilibrium instead you can check if uh, the structure has an instability condition or not by checking two conditions uh, first is if there is a, if there is a significant divergent displacement or a very unusual displacement in the structure second is the loss of equilibrium condition uh, you can check the static check table in the post processing mode and see if the total applied load is same as the total reaction or not. So let's see the various stability analysis capabilities instead. Essentially, we have defined it under two categories. First is the linear stability analysis or the eigenvalue analysis. Second is nonlinear stability analysis. Now, the linear stability analysis, which we also call the eigenvalue buckling analysis, few of its behavior benefits as well as drawbacks are like. This is just a mathematical way to determine the instability point by solving the eigenvalue problem and it is an elastic linear analysis which gives you the quick estimation of the critical load and it but it doesn't provide you the detail of any pre and post buckling re regime now as this analysis doesn't entail any iteration and the solution is straightforward so it takes lesser amount of computational time and effort uh, after the solution the program would provide you the information on the buckling load and the mode shapes but these sh mode shapes doesn't provide you of any information on the numerical displacement and the stress 
on the other hand the nonlinear stability analysis is much more practical approach i am highlighting only the few of the salient points of three approaches first is the geometric nonlinear analysis which is also known as gnl as it is a separate analysis mode instead few of its attributes are like this is the most exact method where the stiffness is modified at each deformed shape of the structure upon the incremental application of the load this analysis can be used in any type of structure of any shape especially effective for the structure that undergoes large deflection however it needs huge computational time as the program modifies the stiffness matrix at each iteration and each load steps second is the p delta analysis this is an exact method for capturing the small and large delta that means the drift and the internal deformation of the building like structure here the force factor is modified at each iteration keeping the stiffness matrix constant so only in the geometric stiffness matrix method program modifies the stiffness matrix and that too once based on the initial configuration now this is generally not recommended for building which may undergo significantly large magnitude of deformation now the third one is the direct analysis this is just a p-delta analysis running at the background just conforming to some AIC guidelines for addressing the geometric nonlinearity and the material nonlinearity due to the residual stress in the steel structure so we'll discuss in detail in next webinar. See the picture. The large delta denotes the drift of the portal frame and the small delta is the internal crookedness of the member. Take the example of the cantilever column where the vertical load P and the horizontal load V are applied at the tip. In the traditional first order analysis, the moment at the base should be M equal to v times l now just let's expand the structural behavior in this situation the v lateral load creates the delta displacement at the tip of the member and the vertical load p is already sitting there so this vertical load generates an additional moment of p times delta inducing the second order moment so the total moment now is v into l plus p times delta which is higher than the moment we obtained in the first order analysis. Similarly, the internal out of a straightness curvature in the member creates small delta, which further adds to the additional second order effect. So here the responses like displacement, moment, shear, etc. are all nonlinear. And so the structural behavior is nonlinear in nature. this is a common question we receive can we ignore the p delta effect or should we consider this effect in the analysis now the answer is not that straightforward steel design code like aac 366 16 strongly suggests considering the second order effect in the analysis however there are certain partial conditional exceptions like aac 366 16 class number c1b allows the engineer to exclude only the p small delta effect remember it's not p large delta only if certain conditions are satisfied also the chapter number 7.3 of aic 36016 permits the engineer to perform the first order elastic analysis only if the conditions like drift ratio between the second order analysis to the first order analysis and the ratio of the required axial compressive strength to the cross-sectional compressive strength are within the prescribed limit. Also, the AAC 7 code, uh, clause numbers 12.8.7 states that if the stability index, uh, which can be calculated from the formula mentioned there, if it is less than 0.1, then for the seismic case, the P-delta effect can be neglected. However, this relaxation is only for calculating the drift and not the strength limit state now similarly for the euro code there are certain conditions depending on which the first order elastic analysis are allowed to be performed there are several methods to capture the p delta effect uh, first one is the first order elastic analysis 
whose results are amplified by some expression to get the second order effect. Uh, and the second one is the rigorous second order analysis where the iterative and the non-iterative p-delta analysis methods come under. So the first approach is by using the first order elastic analysis, which is further magnified to get the second order effect. Now, this is the simplest and approximate way to determine the result of the second order effect. If your computer program doesn't have the capability to perform the rigorous second order analysis to capture the P large delta and P small delta. Here the structure is first performed with the first order elastic analysis or the linear elastic analysis and then factored by an amplification coefficient. Uh, the generic expression is like 1 over 1 minus P over PCR where P is the applied load and PCR is the Euler crippling load. The ASC 36016 code uses this generic expression with some modification to formulate two equations mentioned in the appendix 8 for determining the P small delta and P large delta in the terms of B1 and B2 factors. Then comes the rigorous second order analysis. Here one has to compute the second order effect directly and rigorously. First method that I have mentioned here is the iterative p-delta analysis. And this approach is to determine the exact second order effect. Here at every iteration, the displacement and the corresponding forces are recalculated until the solution converges. Here is one of the simple example which is illustrated only with the P large delta for the simplicity. Now, this is a simple cantilever column of length L with H and P acting on the tip. Due to the lateral load H, a moment is first developed at the base with the magnitude of H times L. So let's call it MT0. Now, due to the lateral force, a lateral displacement or a drift should also be developed at the tip. Now let's call it as a delta 1. Now to determine the delta 1 we can use the moment MT0 and the lateral stiffness of the column. So again the vertical load P is sitting on the top with the lever arm distance of delta 1 generating the additional moment of uh, P times delta 1. So my total moment is modified to like P times delta 1 plus H times L. Uh, let's call it MT1. Now if you reversely compute the displacement from the modified moment MT1 one then the displacement now is this one delta 2 which is dependent on the modified moment mt1 now interestingly this displacement is not the same as delta 1 which we had used to compute the modified moment mt1 that means my equilibrium condition has not been reached for equilibrium condition both the displacement delta 1 and the force mt1 should be interdependent or in other words in the equilibrium condition you could have determined the delta 1 value from mt1 and the vice versa so we need to use the displacement delta 2 and move forward now in the second iteration again the load P is acting on the delta 2 drift creating the additional moment of MT2. Now these steps should be repeated up to n number of iteration till we reach the equilibrium condition or when the delta n is almost equal to delta n minus 1. The detailed calculation is covered in my Bentley community post. So you can scan the QR code here to access the link. Now, the solution could either converge or diverge depending on the stiffness and the applied load P. Lateral load H is just acting as the initial drift or the initial disturbing factor. 
if the difference between the consecutive response like displacement or force keeps on increasing then it is the solution is diverging or else the solution is converging so the diverging means the structure is unstable or had collapsed converging means structure is in stable equilibrium condition few characteristic of this method this is an exact method where we are meticulously reaching the response by the iterative process where the force vector is only changed keeping the stiffness matrix constant now as this is an iterative method in a large structure it might need more time and computer resource the next method to handle the rigorous p delta analysis is by using the geometric stiffness matrix or the kg matrix this is an alternate procedure to capture the p delta effect into the analysis by combining the global stiffness matrix and the global geometric stiffness matrix forming a new matrix called k plus kg matrix now here k matrix is also known as the elastic stiffness matrix as it is dependent on the elastic property of the element and the kg is a uh, or the kg matrix is the stress stiffening matrix as it is dependent on the axial stress the member experiences now see the diagram here to have the basic understanding of the kg matrix uh, when a rope is stretched by some significant magnitude of tension its lateral load carrying capacity increases so that one can walk over it and conversely if you hold a, a broomstick or a slender cane stick and put some compression over it then it's then a slight lateral nudge at the center could cause the stick to buckle or may undergo large lateral displacement so in the former case it is called stress stiffening and in the later case it is called stress softening so in both the situation the lateral load bearing capacity changes with the applied axial load so the kg matrix is similarly formed by such stress stiffening components of the element so here only two steps of analysis are performed by the program first the primary deflection is computed from the linear static analysis and then these deflections are used to calculate the member axial forces and these forces are then used to calculate the geometric stiffness matrix term and please note that both the large and small delta are considered here now the result of this method is approximately close to the iterative analysis result uh, the result might slightly deviate depending on the sensitivity of the structure to the second order effect. So we will see this with some case studies later. Few salient points of the P-delta geometric stiffness matrix methods are like, firstly, this is an approximate method. Second, it is an iterative method where the force vectors are not changed. This is relatively faster as no iterations are involved. Please note that the superposition is permitted only for the building like structure here. So one can use the load combination only for the building like structure. Uh, one can refer to various research paper on this uh, from the internet. Now, as this method doesn't need the iteration and as the load combination is allowed in the building like structure, we could perform model analysis like response spectrum analysis and easily combine the dynamic load case with the static load case. So this method is numerically efficient for the building like structure. However, in other kind of structure, you could use the repeat load instead. So in short, any tall building which is sensitive to the P-delta effect and are exposed to the earthquake excitation such type of structure can be easily handled by this method now please see the syntax that i have created for a similar model now you could see that if i change the magnitude of the gravity load p in the static load case 
my natural frequency also get changed. This implies that the frequency is computed in the dynamic load case based on the kg matrix, which is again dependent on the axial force it experiences. Just few points to note from the stat P delta analysis perspective. Uh, first, if you are doing the P delta analysis, you are supposed to use the repeat load option to combine the primary load cases like gravity load case and the lateral load case. This is because the P delta being the nonlinear analysis, superposition or the linear combination is not allowed here. So you can't directly use the load combination option here. Uh, the repeat load case is a new load case which is included in the load vector and stiffness matrix is solved for this load case as well. So here you get a fresh new response against the combined effect. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, only for the P delta kg analysis for the building like structure, one can use the load combination. As here the results of the load combination, although not same as the repeat load, but the results are very close. Another point to note is if you check on the P delta small option in the dialog box, both the large and the small delta are considered. And if you uncheck the button, then only the large delta is considered in the analysis. Now we will discuss on the buckling analysis and its implementation in StatPro. The buckling analysis is a mathematical model to determine the instability point or the bifurcation point. Mathematically, it is under the bifurcation theory. At certain load level, the system suddenly changes its path with the slightest of the disturbance it experiences. At that certain load level, there are two solutions. One is the trivial and one is the non-trivial solution. And hence, we call it as a bifurcation of the path. This analysis is a linear analysis, as you can see on the screen and the graph, as opposed to the non-linear analysis. Please refer to my previous slides where I have mentioned few advantages and disadvantages of the buckling analysis in comparison to the nonlinear analysis. There are two methods available in STAT to perform the buckling analysis. First is the iterative method, where the singularity of the global stiffness matrix consisting of the kg and kg matrix is checked at each iterative increment of the load. Please note that this matrix changes because of the presence of the kg matrix and if at any point the determinant of the resultant stiffness matrix becomes zero. That means its lateral load carrying capacity changes and it becomes zero or it's more susceptible to buckle at this point. To trigger the basic method, invoke the basic solver by adding the command called set star zero just before the join coordinates in your input file. Now, Next is the advanced buckling analysis, which needs advanced solver as it solves the eigenvalue problem. Uh, so use the command call set star three here. Uh, let's now see how the eigenvalue problem arises here. In the previous situation, Stad was using the trial and error approach to see at what value of kg matrix we are getting the determinant value of zero. So rather than trial and error we could plug an unknown variable like bf representing the buckling factor as a factor of kg and then simply equate the determinant to zero now this is a condensed form of the actual eigenvalue equation shown in green uh, here you could see a vector q uh, this vector represents the unknown mode shapes so directly in a single go by this eigenvalue buckling solver you could get the buckling factor and its corresponding mode shapes so after stat has solved the eigenvalue problem we are getting the buckling factor and the q vector which is a buckling mode shape now the bf which is the buckling factor if it is less than one that indicates that the member has already been buckled if it is greater than one that means the member is yet to buckle if it is in between zero and minus one the element will buckle in the direction opposite to the direction of the applied load so from there you can find the crippling load pcr or the buckling load which is simply 
as a buckling factor times the applied load. The most common buckling mode shapes that we come across in our civil engineering structures are like flexural buckling, torsional buckling, lateral torsional buckling, flexural torsional buckling, local element buckling. Now the first four are the global buckling modes and or we can call it the member buckling mode. And the last one is the local element buckling mode where the localized buckling of the element happens. If you model by the member element, you could see the flexural buckling mode in the post-processing mode. And for all the other modes can be visualized if you model them by the plate elements. These are the flexural buckling modes. In general, the first positive mode is the mode of the concern. STAT by default reports only the first four buckling modes and its corresponding buckling factor. You can use the command set buckling modes n, where n is the number of requested mode, just before the joint coordinates to get the n number of modes. Now, although the first buckling mode is required, but one can get a lot of idea from the consequent modes. Uh, see the second mode in the picture. At the midpoint, as there is no lateral movement in the second mode, the designer can get the idea to introduce the lateral bracing at this optimum position. Just a quick tip here. Try to subdivide the member with internal nodes to get more degrees of freedom and get better mode shapes. Let's take an example. First, I have performed the buckling analysis with a given load and found the first two buckling mode like this. The load bearing capacity of this member is the applied load times the first buckling factor, uh, which is 3.3. Now, my interest is to improve the buckling load capacity of this member by providing a single lateral bracing at the optimum location of this column. Uh, let's quickly see the second mode shape and have some idea of the point which undergone least deformation. So the point is uh, node number 10. Now I had imposed a lateral restraint at that point after performing a new set of buckling analysis, the new buckling load factor is 9.89. Similarly, let's check for the two different location in the neighborhood of node number 10 and compare the buckling load bearing capacity. So in both the situation, buckling load factors are lesser than that of node number 10 and hence the optimum lateral bracing point is node number 10. These are the finite element models for understanding the local buckling modes or the lateral torsion and buckling modes. Now, few points to note for buckling analysis instead. First, the solid and the curved member cannot participate in the buckling analysis instead. Second is if you are performing the global buckling analysis, which is the frame buckling analysis or the meshed plate buckling analysis, program will only provide you the numerical information on the buckling load that causes the overall system to buckle, but it won't tell you the weakest member or the element first to buckle. However, one can see the buckling mode shape and its pattern to get some rough idea of the weakest member or the element in the overall structure. We have another powerful and the most accurate way of performing the geometric nonlinear analysis. And this is a separate geometric nonlinear analysis algorithm. Although P delta analysis is also a geometric nonlinear analysis, but P delta analysis is mostly for the building like structure, which doesn't have too much of drift and deformation. The geometric nonlinear analysis, also called as a GNL method, in addition to capturing the small and the large delta effect. It also changes the stiffness matrix of the deformed shape of the structure at every iteration processed in every incremental applied load steps. So simply put it in this way, simply imagine if you are slowly ad adding the weight on the portal frame at the center 
and at certain instance when the horizontal member of the portal frame undergoes huge deflection vertically downward as it experiences tension as well because of the large deformation effect just like hanging clothes on the rope so we won't discuss too much on this subject because the p delta analysis is a standard method that most of the design codes specifies for the building so uh, let's uh, take an example quick example on how to perform the geometric nonlinear analysis instead i have taken a simple portal frame and i have applied uh, some gravity load and the lateral load and the gravity load value is significantly high and i have taken the value which is close to the buckling load so that i can see a very nice uh, displacement versus load curve because higher the value of the gravity load and if as it approaches the buckling load the structure is very much sensitivity to nonlinearity so now i will instruct to perform the nonlinear analysis but before that i have to change some analysis criteria uh, you can select this nonlinear analysis step now here it, you can see there are a lot of uh, different settings most of them are default so you can uh, change the default settings so let me go through few of the important uh, analysis criteria first one is iterations uh, iterations like by default it is 100 a program at each incremental load step it will keep on iterating up to the maximum limit of these values here it is 100 now iteration means at each iteration program would keep on uh, modifying the stiffness matrix of the structure depending on its updated deformed shape and it is also called the tangent stiffness matrix now as it keeps on iterating and uh, this is the tolerance limit that you have defined uh, if the two consecutive iteration values are very much close to each other and within the tolerance limit uh, at that point the iteration would cease so you can define the tolerance value here and this is the load step that i have defined a load step is something like for example in this model you have defined 100 kilonewton of total load now if I define 10 load step then what it means is like 100 by 10 is 10 so there would be 10 intervals and these intervals would be incremental in nature so program keep on adding first 10 kilonewton then again adding another 10 kilonewton so it will analyze for first time is 10 second time it will analyze for 20 kilonewton then 30 kilonewton up to it reaches the maximum applied load at each load step it will keep on doing the modification of the stiffness matrix so that you can get the realistic nature of the deformation and if you want to include the kg matrix you can click on here and uh, there are different other settings like if you want to limit the displacement so i will take here like 50 uh, load steps and click on add let's perform the analysis so you can see at each load step program is performing the analysis and within at within the load steps it is performing the iteration so up to three iterations you can see here the solution has converged for this load step so this is the post processing mode there you go to layout there, there are two options you can see the response in two different format first is the displacement response and then the mem uh, force response so let's see the displacement response here so click on this displacement response uh, click on node cursor now here you can see there is a graph now you can see completely blank uh, I am interested in seeing the lateral displacement so click here and select this one and select the node against which you want to see the displacement of the curve now you click on this one so that you can see the sequential way of uh, reproducing the graph so you can see as I click click on adding the load step it program keeps on adding the load and you can see here the displacement graph it is also increasing so till I go to something like 50 
there is a huge displacement and uh, you can see this is the pattern of the graph similar way you can see the beam forces so that is how you can quickly check the nonlinear response Till now we have seen various analysis methods to check the stability of the structure. So we will quickly take some comparison and some general issues while performing the stability analysis in StatPro Connect Edition. Now we will check the structure sensitivity to the geometric nonlinearity. So I've taken a simple portal shear frame and applied a vertical load value whose value is very close but less than the buckling load. And then I have performed the first order elastic analysis and then PDL the iterative and non iterative analysis and the separate geometric nonlinear analysis in separate instances. So, after performing the analysis, we could see that there is a big difference between the first order analysis and all the various forms of nonlinear analysis, even though the P delta kg analysis response is slightly spaced from the P delta iterative analysis. Also, the geometric nonlinear analysis method shows the value somewhat lesser. Now, let's go to another scenario where we have applied the load whose value has been scaled down 10 times up to the value of uh, 325 kilonewton. So, similarly, after performing all the set of analysis run, what we could see here is that all the values are almost same even though the first order analysis displacement response is slightly less. So we have tabulated the result to summarize the comparison and then we'll draw some inference from here. Now here's the comparison for both the cases. In the first case, the response is highly spaced and sensitive to the second order effect. Now a few of the observation that we have noticed are like when the gravity load approaches the buckling load, the nonlinear response is several times higher than the linear response. Now, the second one is like P delta kg matrix method, the result starts getting deviated from the iterative one as the gravity load approaches the buckling load. And the third is like GNL, that is geometric nonlinear analysis method result, is several times higher than the first order analysis. But yet it is different from P delta method, even though both are nonlinear analysis. So at smaller gravity load, as the nonlinear effect is minuscule, and hence all the results are very close to each other. Now you can see on in the stable right part. So the inference that we can draw from these observations are like. It is strongly suggested to perform the secondary analysis to capture any catastrophic effect if that goes unnoticed in the first order analysis, uh, especially for the structure that carries huge gravity loads like a water tank or a tall building or um, a steel industrial structure which are very much prone to side sway. So maybe in future I could uh, come up with more case studies on the tall structure or a structure with long columns or braced and unbraced framing systems to show you how they are sensitive to the second order effect. Second inference uh, that we can make is P delta K plus KG matrix as it is an approximate method. So only for the mildly nonlinear situation only we may use the P delta K plus KG matrix or else for any other situation we may want to perform the iterative P delta analysis. And uh, probably that is the reason that you, while you perform the analysis with the P delta K plus KG matrix, you come up with a generic warning message in the ANL file as shown here. Third inference is the GNL method, if it can be used, but only if if there is a very high drift or internal deformation. Uh, in uh, real life, uh, civil engineering structure, mostly the building or the industrial structure are not supposed to undergo high magnitude of drift for the serviceability criteria. 
and uh, on top of that uh, the GNL method needs more computational time and resource compared to P delta analysis so P delta analysis is the most suitable method for building or the industrial steel structure Now let's compare the linear buckling analysis and the nonlinear analysis like P-delta method. Now in reality buckling doesn't exist. Uh, yes, you heard it right. Uh, it is just a mathematical instability point which doesn't show the exact path to reach that point. So all we can do is add a straight linear graph from zero load to the crippling load and see the elastic deformation the member experienced just before reaching the buckling load and hence it is known as the linear buckling. But in reality the path is not linear in nature it's a uh, non-linear every member has a, a finite amount of initial imperfection like uh, out of straightness or out of plumbness even though it's extremely minuscule at the microscopic level and due to this uh, initial imperfection under the axial load p a small amount of secondary movement generates and the corresponding deflection you may uh, recall the iterative p delta analysis and due to this additional deformation, the additional moment is again generated and uh, gets accumulated as this is an additive process. And if this phenomenon is divergent in nature, then it indicates that the system has buckled or collapsed. So this divergent point starts from a threshold limit and this limit is just uh, the instability limit point or what we can call it as a buckling point. And this threshold limit is fixed for the structure with same stiffness and boundary condition irrespective of the lateral or the gravity load the amount of initial imperfection or the stability analysis method that you have used like eigenvalue method or nonlinear method so it doesn't depend on these parameters uh, yes you have to just add some non-zero initial imperfection to trigger the iteration process ultimately your a liable load will not exceed that threshold limit. Here is another example that shows whatsoever is the lateral load that mimics the eccentricity there is always a maximum axial load the structure can handle just before getting unstable or buckled. So smaller is the eccentricity higher the visibility of sudden collapse although there is always a small flexure or deflection before the collapse event. Now regarding this, uh, there are some common questions on the warning message we receive from our user who performed the P-delta analysis instead. The first one is like, uh, here you can see, uh, infinite or non -dis value of displacement for iterative P-delta. And the second one is like pivoting applied for small zero or zero pivot, which is for the P-delta kg case now both the message indicate the structure has already been buckled or collapsed first the iterative case as i mentioned before if the solution got divergent then it indicates that the member has already been buckled and for the non-iterative case or the p delta geometric stiffness matrix method as program is directly solving the k plus kg matrix against the applied load and if the determinant of the k plus kg matrix becomes zero that is what we call it singular then program tries to readjust internally throwing this warning message so if the k plus kg matrix becomes zero it indicates that the member has already been buckled and you can recall my uh, previous slide on buckling analysis for more reference on this now the next question that we commonly receive is like can we apply the response like moments, drift, deformation, etc. that we got in the post-processing table for designing the structure for strength and serviceability limit state when the structure is analyzed at the buckling load? Now, to answer this question, we would first take you to some illustration with some comparison. Now, I have created a model and applied a load slightly more than the buckling load. The lateral displacement after performing the analysis I got for node number 3 is around 0.05 meter. Now please note this uh, uh, number. 
let's do a nonlinear analysis like GNN analysis in the same model. Now, after performing the analysis, we could see that the structure attained the 0 0.05 meter lateral displacement at the load level of just around 49% of the buckling load limit. This means that in case of eigenvalue method, you are under the impression that for 0 0.05 meter drift, your structure can handle maximum 831 kN of the gravity load. But in reality, your structure can handle only maximum of 50% uh, of the buckling load till the same drift is achieved. Now, same thing is also applicable for moment and other for force responses. So, the eigenvalue buckling method can sometimes provide you the underestimated force results like lateral displacement, moment, etc. Uh, the simple reason is that these forces are the linear response and they are not the nonlinear response. So, it is suggested to use these results with caution. However, we would strongly suggest that to perform the nonlinear analysis and use the responses for designing. So in the nutshell, the eigenvalue method is just to roughly estimate if your structure has collapsed or not. And secondly, it might be useful for calculating the key factor value or the effective length factor value uh, by the effective length method or ELM method suggested by various design codes, although the approach is very much abstract. So a last quick note here on a STAD model. Say for example, you have a numerous primary load cases and according to several international steel design codes like Eurocode, where one is advised to first check the stability of the frame structure by first performing the buckling analysis and compare if the buckling factor value is within the specified allowable range for a specific gravity load combinations only. And then depending on that, one needs to perform the second order analysis. So instead, in the same model, you could perform the buckling analysis for the selected load combos in conjunction with the P-delta analysis. So all you need to do is call the load combos by the repeat load case just after the P-delta analysis followed by the change command and then perform the buckling analysis in the same model. So you can see the syntax on the screen. So thank you all for attending the session. Now we will open the floor for any questions you have.